From Miami Law, I'm Annette Uges, and this is The Explainer. If you're going to find people supporting the death penalty, you know, if it's a child victim, that's an easy one to sort of get a, a, a outrage over. Um, so it's those are the types of cases which tend to be chosen in part because the death penalty is sort of on the ropes. And so they're trying to sort of use the individuals who are being chosen to be executed as a way of saying, oh, look at the death penalty really is for the worst of the worst while back on death row are all the other people who are seriously mentally ill, intellectually disabled, the ones who would be more likely to cause a softening of uh, support for the death penalty. Welcome back to season six of the Miami Law Explainer, the legal affairs podcast where Miami law experts lend context and historical relevance to today's headlines. South Carolina has recently introduced a bill to allow death by firing squad as a death penalty option. Virginia just passed legislation to abolish the death penalty, the first Southern state to do so. And 13 of the 17 federal executions in the last 60 years were carried out under the Trump administration. Death penalty expert Scott Sunbeat tracks where we've been and where we're going. Let's go to executive producer Catherine Skip with the interview. Hey, good morning, Scott. Nice to have you back. Good morning, Catherine. It's good to be back. Um, so let's start with the, the latest news. Virginia and South Carolina both have had shifts in their death penalty arena. Uh, and the Trump administration uh, could be labeled as an actual killing machine in, in its final days. Where does America's tolerant temperature for execution stand? So some of it is geographical. Um, Some of it is political, surprise, surprise, Um, because if you look at the overall trend, uh, it is definitely the death penalty on its way out Um, or it appears to be on its way out. I've got a caveat to add at the end of uh, my little uh, spiel here. Um, But I mean, it is astonishing. Virginia abolished the death penalty by the legislature uh, last week. And I moved to Virginia in 1992 in part because it had such an active death penalty. And that was my area of specialty and where I was getting involved. And if you had asked me 20 years ago when I moved there um, how much money I would wager that the death penalty would be abolished in Virginia, um, I would have lost a ton of money. Uh, and I didn't have a ton of money to lose because... It was one of the top three states in terms of imposing the death penalty and actually carrying it out. Um, the capital defense bar was extremely discouraged overall because uh, the law was so much against them. Uh, so to see that type of turnaround in two decades is just astonishing. Um, and of course, it's the first southern state to uh, really have abolished it. Um, And uh, there are other signs uh, that even in the South, uh, the death penalty is in retreat. Uh, While South Carolina and Georgia have not taken steps to abolish it, if you look at the number of death sentences that each has imposed over the last decade, South Carolina, a grand total of three death sentences over the last 10 years, Georgia, four in the last 10 years. Um, And so what we're really coming down to is... There are now a handful of states, uh, really three of them, California, Texas, and Florida, uh, that are imposing the death sentence with any regularity. And California kind of doesn't count because they have not executed someone. And it's almost a de facto abolition state. Um, so there were 18 death sentences total, total in 2020. Five of those were in California. And again, those don't really count in terms of, you know, sentences likely to be carried out. Um, and it's really Florida and Texas. And Florida accounted for over half, over half of the national death sentences last year, right? They had seven. And if you take away California, uh, it goes down, uh, to 13 and they, they had seven. So, um, Can I just ask you a quick question here about about those numbers? Uh, I, I, maybe I'm wrong, but in Florida and maybe in other places, um, the people that are actually uh, being executed uh, 
some of them are very high profile cases where where public sentiment is very uh, strong uh, in favor of the execution or the family is is very vocal. And the rest of them are all volunteers. Is that correct? Or do I have that? Um, so uh, the, uh, yes and no. So the the people who are being put forward to be executed, and this was clearest on the federal level when William Barr uh, was choosing the people that they were going to execute in a rush at the end of the Trump uh, era. Um, he was choosing people who had done uh, crimes involving children. And those are the crimes where people, you know, if you're going to find people supporting the death penalty, you know, if it's a child victim, that's an easy one to sort of get a, a, a outrage over. Um, so it's those are the types of cases which tend to be chosen in part because the death penalty is sort of on the ropes. And so they're trying to sort of use the individuals who are being chosen to be executed as a way of saying, oh, look at the death penalty really is for the worst of the worst, while back on death row are all the other people who are seriously mentally ill, intellectually disabled, the ones who would be more likely to cause a softening of uh, support for the death penalty. Uh, and otherwise, uh, like you said, some of them are volunteers, that is individuals who have been on death row and say, I wanna waive my appeals, and be executed, uh, many of whom often are very mentally ill. Um, and so uh, that is sort of who the group who's being uh, executed uh, is being narrowed down to. Um, but those tend to be people who have been on death row for many, many years, uh, many of whom, to be quite honest, probably would not be on death row today um, if they were tried and went before a jury because uh, jury sentiments have uh, change. De defense representation has gotten so much better uh, that uh, I have no doubt that some of the individuals uh, who have been executed would not have gotten death sentences, even if they were tried today. Mm -hmm. um, so recent studies on race and race victim in death penalty sentence skew heavily in favor of punishing black defendants and most especially where the victim is white with that ultimate punishment. How much do high rates of exonerations and the racial disparity in meeting out the punishment play in Black Lives Matter America? So um, I guess the one thing I would point out is those studies, um, there are recent studies that show this racial disparity, uh, but there are studies going back to the early 1980s which show that racial disparity, especially that if you were a black man killing a white victim, uh, the chances of getting a death sentence were uh, statistically uh, much higher. Uh, and that case actually went to the Supreme Court in 1987 in a case called McCluskey versus Kemp, which is a uh, notorious, infamous case in the death penalty world, uh, because the court came within one vote of effectively abolishing the death penalty because of racial discrimination. Uh, Justice Powell cast the deciding vote and wrote the opinion. And after he retired, Catherine, he was asked if there was one case he could go back and change his vote in, what case would it be? And he said McCluskey versus Kemp. And so that was, you know, 30 plus years ago. We wouldn't be having this conversation if he had actually voted in that direction. So the problems of race discrimination are legion. In fact, the death penalty has deep roots in the black codes where blacks could get death sentences, and especially in southern states that whites could not. Uh, one of the reasons it, it was used so widely in the South was because of uh, slave uprisings uh, as a way to uh, punish those and deter those. So, I mean, the roots go way back. Um, and so this is not a shock to anyone who has followed the death penalty in any way that uh, studies continue to come out showing that it's being used in a racially uh, discriminatory fashion. I do think that um, it has gotten added uh, attention in terms of sort of fueling uh, opposition to the death penalty uh, because of things like George Floyd, Black Lives Matters and the sense that the criminal justice system as a whole is uh, quite uh, discriminatory. And, and this is just simply the most high profile sort of example of it. 
Um, and you mentioned exonerations. That undoubtedly over the last 20 years has played a huge role uh, as people realize that individuals have ended up on death row, sometimes within hours of being executed, who in fact were innocent. Um, and, and I think that combined with racial discrimination, combined with the fact that most people recognize that the death penalty does not deter, right? Which was a huge argument in the eighties and nineties. Uh, we have to have the death penalty because look at violent crime. It's the only way to deter it. And, and polls now show that the vast majority of Americans don't think that it deters crime. So sort of the basic principles as to why the death penalty continued on are sort of being knocked away uh, one by one. Good. Um, President Biden has said that the death penalty is abhorrent. So what are his options and and can he make any permanent changes or is it executive order that gets overturned in, in the next administration? So the only way to really permanently uh, abolish the death penalty on the federal level is with a statute abolishing it that the uh, president would then have to sign into law. Um, he does have some things which he can do in the short term. Uh, he can impose a moratorium on executions um, so that rush to execute, execute, which we saw William Barr and Donald Trump do, uh, would not happen. Um, federal death sentences, the seeking of a federal death sentence actually has to be approved by the Department of Justice. And they have a central committee that reviews the cases where a U.S. attorney wants it. Um, that group could be told we don't want death sentences approved. And that would basically uh, stop it on uh, that end. Um, he, of course, could grant clemency to anyone who's on federal death row. And I think there's 48 people on federal death row these days. So uh, he could clear out death row. What would, that would do is uh, reduce their death sentences from uh, capital punishment to life uh, without parole. Um, but beyond that, um, he's got his uh, hands limited unless he can convince uh, Congress to, in fact, abolish the death penalty, which I think uh, given the composition in the Senate in particular with the filibuster uh, would be at this point very unlikely. Mm -hmm. um, so let's talk a little about state versus uh, federal. As you said, the, the feds have 48 maybe uh, inmates still on death row, but states have roughly 2,500, though notably that number has been in decline for the past 18 years or so. How and, and can I add one other qualifier to that number, uh, Catherine? Of it, course, it, of a course. huge number, and I don't have it in front of me, but I, 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 last I checked, it was like 750 is in California. So, mm. I mean, you are talking about, again, Cal and the reason that number keeps growing in California is and California keeps sentencing people to death. And let me be, you know, kind of nuanced here. Two counties in California keep sentencing people to death. Riverside County, which if it was a state, would lead the country in terms of uh, death sentences, and L.A. County. If you take those two counties out, most years California would have no death sentences. So they keep putting people on death row, but they're not executing, which is why it's expanding. So that number, which is, I think you said around 2,500, right, is actually somewhat inflated by almost a third uh, because of the number of California people on death row. Um, and there's a number of other states, such as the state of Washington, Pennsylvania, that have moratoriums where people are not being executed. And it's probably unlikely uh, that'll change in the future. But you're right. There are still a number of people on state death rows. I just thought I'd mm -hmm. add that qualifier. Yeah, I know. Great. Um, so then how does actual top to bottom change happen? And and what could an ordinary American do to uh, to to affect or or push for that change? And so then with that, you're saying that all these states have moratoriums. Is that something that's by the legislature or by the governor? So if you got in a real law and order kind of governor, could he go, let's kill them all? Yeah. So the moratorium is almost always through the governor's office. And and you're right. It can change with the change in the uh, governor's mansion for sure. 
Um, and, uh, you know, which is why Virginia is so interesting. It started with a moratorium and then moved into the legislature. And, uh, you know, the legislature voted to abolish with some Republicans voting to abolish. Um, and so it's something that is starting to uh, gain sort of political momentum. Uh, again, it, when I moved to Virginia in the early 90s, uh, and this may still be true in Florida, uh, if you opposed the death sentence and you were running for statewide office, it was the proverbial third rail. You just stood no chance. Um, and it is now just not, or and certainly now that they've abolished it, but even before that, it was just not an issue. Um, prominent politicians were coming out against the death penalty and getting elected. So some of it is the change just in the electorate's viewpoint um, that makes it possible for these things to happen. Um, you know, Texas and Florida are probably the two states that uh, are going to remain using the death penalty in the near future. Um, and, you know, both, well, certainly Texas is changing demographically, but it really is a political issue is what's becoming clear, right? Is as the uh, political uh, will to uh, have the death penalty wanes, uh, the support for it really starts to fall away. And this is true in part, Catherine, because um, it is remarkably expensive. <clears throat> I mean, it's, and I'm not just talking about death penalty trials, which I think most people will now realize cost millions of dollars. Usually most studies show four to five times more expensive than if the death penalty was not being pursued. But when you are talking that Florida had seven death sentences last year, um, which leads the country, but is still a minuscule number. And the prosecutors failed to get death sentences, even though they tried in a number of uh, uh, trials. Um, <clears throat> you are talking about having a system that is up and running. Uh, you have to have constant training of judges, concentrating, constant training of defense attorneys, uh, investigations of cases that may or may not go capital. It is costing millions and millions of dollars. It's sort of like having an aircraft carrier uh, and all the expenses of an aircraft carrier in order to patrol a little island with, you know, 50 inhabitants. I mean, at some point, it just does not make financial sense. And um, and I think the public at some point says, you know, if we're only having uh, a handful of death sentences a year, many who will sit on death row for 20 plus years and then get their death sentences overturned, is this a system that really makes sense? Um, but can I add one sort of uh, glass half empty uh, observation? <laughs> of course, of course. Um, because here's what's here's also what's fascinating. We were at this point once before. People, a lot of people don't realize it. In 1968, we effectively had uh, abolished the death penalty in terms of the number of death sentences nationwide had plummeted executions were practically zero. Um, and there was that for the first time, Gallup poll showed that a majority of uh, Americans opposed the death sentence, uh, a death penalty. And so you had this sense, if we were talking in 1969, and I was wearing my bell bottoms, and you had flowers in your hair, I'd be saying, Catherine, Death penalties on the way out, um, you know, and uh, Richard Nixon will never be president again, right? Um, and and with my <laughs> usual prog prog prognosticator uh, insight, I would have gotten it totally wrong, right? And um, we're there. In 1972, the Supreme Court effectively uh, abolished the death penalty, and we have the justices' notes that show that several of them said, well, Let's just get rid of it because it's clear that's the direction the Supreme or excuse me, the country's headed. And they, too, were wrong. And uh, the death penalty came back, obviously, with a vengeance. Right. And uh, from 1976, when the Supreme Court allowed the death penalty to be reinstituted up to 1999, um, the number of death sentences, I won't say skyrocketed, because even at its peak, we had less than 400 death sentences a year. 
And again, when you think how many murders occur in the United States a year, that's that's again a handful. It's down to 18 last year. Right. But um, even at its peak, it wasn't that high. But I guess I'm just saying all signs right now are that the death penalty is in retreat. And I think it's maybe a little bit stronger than it was in 1968 in the sense that state legislatures such as in Virginia, Colorado, Maryland, Connecticut are all actually actively abolishing it. So it's not coming through the courts this time and more through the legislatures. Um, and so, you know, all indicators right now are that the death penalty is in real uh, trouble. Um, but you still have states like Florida and Texas, uh, which, if anything, you're finding uh, some push to expand the death penalty to make it easier to use. Um, and until those states uh, change, it's very unlikely that it'll be gone on a national level. Um, so the average American um, could affect change in the in the ballot box. Like yeah. that, that was really the only place. Right. So I think if you yeah. And, and if you do it at the ballot box, it is very unlikely to come back. Right. The problem is when you have a court strike it down. Uh, usually it's struck down in a way that the legislature can, uh, respond, right? And, and bring it back. Um, whereas if it's the legislature, um, it's still possible. I don't know if you remember what happened in Nebraska a couple of years ago where the legislature actually abolished it and then there was a referendum and the referendum brought it back. So there, there is still this tendency to, uh, for some populations, uh, states to be reluctant to give it up, um, even if it's used very, very rarely and it's uh, expensive. But um, I think that reluctance is becoming uh, somewhat less and less. The other place at the ballot box you can have an effect is with prosecutors. Um, as I indicated earlier, um, you know, we talk about, well, it's a Florida, Texas, um, you know, Oklahoma, California phenomenon. Um, it really is a county phenomenon. There are just certain counties in California, right? It's just Riverside and LA County. And if you changed who the DAs were, the district attorneys in those uh, counties, uh, to uh, district attorneys who did not want to seek the death penalty, you effectively would remove the death penalty from California. Uh, likewise, Florida tends to have certain counties that use the death penalty in a lot of counties, uh, such as Miami-Dade, that do not. Um, and so, uh, in some ways, the, the most effective way would be uh, if you actually elected uh, state attorneys as what we call district attorneys or prosecutors in Florida or district attorneys in other states, uh, who, who said, I will not seek the death penalty. Um, if you did that, you would sort of have de facto, uh, abolition in, in, in many states. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, on the federal, on the federal level, uh, it, did Timothy McVeigh's case was actually kind of the, the tipping point. And can you talk a little about, the number of federal executions carried out uh, under under the Trump administration, was it very different than other administrations or just very different than recent administrations? So um, the the what was so striking with uh, the Trump administration was as they realized that the term was coming to an end and uh, we might not have a second uh, Donald Trump term. Uh, there was a real effort by William Barr and the DOJ uh, to <clears throat> do executions in a way that just had not been seen. Uh, so the executions at the end uh, were as many executions as had, had happened in the six decades prior to that. I mean, that's just astonishing, right? Um, and, um, you know, I don't pretend to understand what William Barr's thinking was. Um, exactly. But, um, there was just sort of this, this is our window to get these people executed. And, and some of them, by the way, uh, Catherine, I don't know as if the press really adequately did a job of explaining the mental illness that several of them had. There were questions about, uh, evidence in some of them. Um, you know, but in any case, he was pushing it hard. 
Um, and again, it's not as if the federal death penalty is being imposed in any type of uh, large numbers. Uh, in fact, over the last 10 years, only 13 people have been sentenced to death uh, on federal charges. Um, so again, almost one a year, right? And we're talking, you know, about things such as the Boston Marathon bombing, right? So um, the federal death penalty actually as an overall picture in the national death penalty uh, scene does not play a big role. Uh, it's just it tends to be often the very high profile cases such as Timothy McVeigh, uh, such as Zarnayev, who was the Boston Marathon bomber. Um, and, um, so I think it gets sort of an oversized, uh, attention, uh, because they tend to be the more high profile cases, but it also highlights why I think there is a reluctance, even for people who are on the fence about the death penalty. Um, it's, but what about Timothy McVeigh? What about the Boston Marathon bomber case, right? What about Dylan Roof? Uh, the person in Charleston who went into the uh, church and shot the parishioners and all, right? Um, but, you know, even in those cases, first of all, Zarnayev, uh death sentence has been reversed by the First Circuit. Uh, it's not clear he's actually going to end up with the death sentence. Dylan Roof uh, fired his attorneys. He had uh, sort of a dream team and he fired them and represented himself and essentially, you know, asked for the death penalty. Um, I'm not sure otherwise that would have happened. Uh, and there are other, you know, cases where really terrible things happen, such as the Aurora, Colorado shooting, um, where five, five people were killed and like 70 wounded. The guy who James Holm dressed up as the Joker and went in. Um, as bad a case as you can imagine in terms of carnage and sympathy for the victims, he got a life sentence. Right. The jury returned a life sentence. So um, what you're finding is even kind of in the what I sometimes call the McVeigh factor cases. Right. The cases that people are just like, oh, so I, here's here's a Gallup poll that illustrates this, uh, Catherine. Uh, right before Timothy McVeigh was executed, uh, there was a Gallup poll or some type of poll saying, do you favor the execution of Timothy F. McVeigh? And like 80 percent said yes. And there was like 10% that said, I'm actually opposed to the death penalty, but I'll make an exception for Timothy McVeigh, right? I mean, so there's, right, right. there's that great, there's that case that just gives great outrage, right? Which I think leads some people to be reluctant to give it up. There's sort of a sense, how, how else do we express that this is so beyond the pale of what we can tolerate as a society other than the death penalty? Um, and I think that explains, you know, why there's still sort of, you know, it's hanging on, uh, because what do we do with the next 9-11? What do we do with the next Boston Marathon bomber? Um, you know, it, it presents problems. Um, it, yeah, I, I'll just one last thing on that, though. One of the 9-11 conspirators, Musawi, got a life sentence from a jury. Right. People forget that. Right. That he actually got a life sentence. So. If you get really good defense attorneys and a jury that is representative and, you know, properly selected, uh, even in the worst of the worst cases, a lot in, in the sense of just, you know, terrible carnage, very sympathetic victims, um, you often get a life sentence, which I think a lot of people don't realize. Mm -hmm. OK, so we've covered. um Motive and opportunity. And I know we, we've talked, uh, in the past, uh, about method. Um, so South Carolina just decided you could choose to be executed by a firing squad. Um, and I, I know that's because of the problem that we've discussed before with the lack of being able to get the, um, the proper, uh, materials to, uh, carry out a lethal injection. Um, so is that just an outlier, just like a weird, Thing? So, you know, it's something, uh, again, it's kind of political theater to some extent. Say the South Carolina, you know, well, we're going to have the firing squad. Some states have said we're going to use nitrous oxide um, in order to execute people, right? Because uh, there's a shortage of lethal injection drugs because pharmacies don't want their drugs associated with, you know, the, 
the the uh, commercial headline, you know, we are the drug of choice for putting people to death, right? So it's really presented um, fascinating headaches for those states that want to execute. So South Carolina, the legislature shows it's tough on crime. We support the death penalty. We're going to bring back the firing squad. Keep in mind what I said earlier, right? Three death sentences total over the past decade in South Carolina. So it's kind of, I won't say a free vote, but it's a way to sort of posture and look tough without actually really having people going before the firing squad, uh, which is, you know, something that I think a lot of the public would probably, you know, start rethinking their attitudes, especially because you know things are going to go wrong. Um, and it's going to be high profile, you know, somebody's going to, you know, suffer, um, you know, if, if they're put before the firing squad. Um, and, and I guess, you know, that's one other thing that I would, would say about sort of the current, uh, movement against the death penalty in terms of public opinion is a lot of the people who are being executed now, say this happened in Alabama. Um, I have been on death row for 20, 30 years. They are elderly. A, they have suffered, for example, strokes. So there was one case in Alabama where basically he was an invalid. They were going to have to wheel him in a wheelchair into the death chamber in order to put him onto the gurney. He suffered from dementia because of the strokes. He basically didn't understand that he was going to be being put to death. And I think, you know, it's sort of like, well, what are we accomplishing, right? I mean, you know, if the Grim Reaper is coming very shortly, you know, do we really need to accelerate it in the name of a state execution? I mean, it's um, so a lot of these, you know, uh, cases, uh, you know, just by the nature of the, the judicial system and, and because we do have some protections, um, are going to take two decades. And, and, you know, legislatures are always, oh, we'll speed that up. Um, it can't be sped up. Um, it's like me trying to run faster. It just isn't going to happen, right? <laughs> My legs won't move faster. The legislature cannot make the judiciary run faster because there's a number of barriers, proper barriers that are put in to make sure that the innocent aren't executed, to make sure that the uh, and mentally ill are not executed, the intellectually disabled. Now, those procedures are not fail safe by any sense, but they are going to make any death sentence by its very inherent terms uh, going to be at least a decade out, often much longer. Mm -hmm. Quick, let's execute it before he dies of natural causes. So we have our revenge. Exactly. exactly. Well, this has been great. Thank you so much for your time <laughs> and expertise. My pleasure, as always. All right, sir. See you around. All right. Ciao. Bye now. Bye. Thanks for joining us at The Explainer for a whole new season of interpreting legal issues in the headlines. If you love our show, leave us a five-star review with your podcast provider and ask your friends to subscribe. You can always drop us a comment at explainer at miami.edu. Our show is engineered and edited by Christopher Alzadi with theme music composed by Rady Kim from the Frost School of Music. I'm your host, Annette Uges. Today's episode is brought to you by the upcoming Hashtag Miami Tech Movement and the Law Panel on Wednesday, April 17th. The Silicon Tech Brothers' migration to Miami and Miami Mayor's bromance with Elon Musk has garnered national attention. For more information, visit law.miami.edu.